You got it? I will begin. No. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for the break. Let's pray that you just uh, help us today uh, to glorify you, Lord, and we do here this day. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So did you, uh, did you enjoy the break? Yes. Yeah. Well, break. Yeah, I know. I feel the same way. All right. Um, <clears throat> so this is lecture 16. And um, hopefully by the time you leave this lecture, you will have a thorough understanding of the distinction and um, relation between the external and internal direct products, okay? So <clears throat> just to set the notation, right? For us, if we say G prime equals to the H uh, cross K, this is the Cartesian product um, of a group H and a group K. Specifically, this is the set of tuples H comma K such that H is from H and K is from K. In contrast, um, we defined that G would be H direct product or direct sum. Um, use the same symbol for direct product and direct sum. I have, I'm sure eventually we'll create another symbol for direct sum versus direct product, but I haven't got around to it, so we're just using the same thing for both because it seems like there's no symbol for direct product at this level of group theory. Anyway, HK that I find in your book, um, this is HK such that H is in um, H is in H, K is in K. Indeed, as a set, this is exactly equal to HK. All right. Um, this is what's meant by the product of two two sets. It's a set of all possible products taken from one or the other. Um, but there's a little bit more that we assume, where uh, we assume we assume a couple things. We assume that um, H intersect K is the identity, and we also assume that H and K are normal subgroups of G. Right. These are different things, right? I mean, you can tell from the set theory here, they're different things. This um, would be a subset, right, of G cross G, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, G cross G. I'm assuming in both of these that uh, H and K are subgroups um, of G from the outset, okay? So you have two subgroups of a given group, G. You can, you can talk about two different things. You talk about taking the external direct product of these subgroups to get what we call H cross K. Or given certain conditions, it could be that G itself is formed from the internal direct product of H and K, where again we need this extra data that the intersection is the identity and that they're both, both normal. I'd like to explain why it is that we assume that the intersection is the identity and that they're both, both normal. Like why is, why is that necessary? What's the real idea here? Let me just tell you the real idea before I show you why the normality is important. The basic idea here is, I mean, th this, right, this is a subset, that, well this is equal to G, right? Th these are different objects, right? They can't be equal, right? <laughs> one is G, one is something in G cross G. These are different things. Um, but what we'd like, the intuition here, is that we'd like the H cross K be isomorphic to H direct sum K. I mean direct product. So the, the idea is that to say that a group is the internal direct sum of two subgroups should mean that that group is in fact isomorphic to just the direct product, the external direct product of those subgroups. That's, that's the idea. Um, so like a positive example would be this. If you take Z2, 
take the external direct sum, I mean direct product rather, excuse me, with Z3, then this is isomorphic to Z2 internal, pro you know, the internal direct sum of Z2 and Z3, which you can show that this in fact is isomorphic. And we'll, we'll make this, this one of the results we'll get today, Z6. All right. Let me show you what happens if we don't have normality here for a second. Show you why we need the normality. So an example, <laughs> we can consider the dihedral group of order six or D3, right? Do you guys know why it's called dihedral? Did I ever tell you? It's got to... Right, it, so it's like you, you have not just a single-sided triangle, for example, you transcribe the symmetries of a single, triangle two sides. So the dihedral actually means two faces. That's why it's the dihedral group. It's two-faced. Um, so you should be, uh, should be careful with it. Let's see here. Um, all right, so you can let H <laughs> equal to the uh, cyclic subgroup generated by X, the rotations, right? And you can let K be the cyclic subgroup generated by Y. Not all the reflections, but it's the reflection one and Y, right? It's pretty easy to calculate that the product of H and K gives you what? First of all, you get one X, X squared, right? Because one times this, this, this gives me that, that, that. And then Y times this, this, this gives me AKA D3, right? So the product of these two subgroups is the whole group, right? What's the intersection? Yeah. So it looks like we're uh, OOE, well, which is for us here one, right, in this notation. Man, this, this, this is looking pretty good, right? Um, I think you can, you can prove that H is a normal subgroup, right? But even, even H is normal, right? You can, you can show H is a normal subgroup of D3. However, if we calculate XK, we get what? We get X and XY, right? But if we calculate KX, we get what? X and YX, right? And YX and XY are different things, aren't they? Why, like this, put back in the standard presentation, is x, um, x squared y, right? Because x inverse is x squared here, right? So as you can see, k is not a normal subgroup. So we don't get to say that, um, we don't get to say that, you know, d3 does not fit the bill. d3 is uh, not the internal direct sum of h and k, right? because we haven't met the normality condition on K. It's almost everything, but not quite. And this is good, because what's the deal with H cross K here? The external product of, the external direct product of H and K is what? You got yourself one one, um, one Y, X one, X Y, X squared one, x squared y. There you go. These are the six things in H cross k. Like, oh, well, the external direct product is still six things, right? D3's got six things. Maybe they're isomorphic. Why are these things, why is H cross k not isomorphic to D3? What do you mean not one to one? Or did I mishear you? What? I just can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you be more specific? Can we find a specific thing to show that these are not isomorphic? Let's pick on this element right here. What's the order of that element? Six. 
Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm showing you that all the power is up to, um, yeah. I mean, in order to show it's order six, we need to show all of the powers before the sixth power are in fact not the identity, right? So there you go, at the sixth power, we get x cubed and y squared. Well, actually we get x cubed squared and y squared cubed. So we get the cube or the square of the identity, which is the identity, yeah. Would that mean that we have a problem because h cross k is cyclic and d3 is Exactly, so this shows, this implies then that h cross k is isomorphic to z6, which of course is not isomorphic to d3, which is not cyclic, right? Or if you want it to be more complicated, you could count the elements of order two in both groups, right? And you see you have to, I mean, there's any number of attacks. What Bradley said is true. If you were to investigate an isomorphism, you'd find out it can't, it doesn't work out. But you know, we want, we want a concrete argument here and this is it. Okay, so there you go. This is an example of how normal, how the lack of normality of the subgroup fails to give you something that's isomorphic to the, to the external direct product, right? So we need this normality. Let's see how it goes. Here's how it doesn't work. Let's see how it works. We need a lemma. A lemma. And here's my lemma. Um, <clears throat> There's not, but there is an element of order six in H cross K. I'm not hearing no, you. No, there is in H cross K, but there isn't in D three. Exactly. So that yes. Okay. Right. I do not disagree with that. So here's the lemma. What if we do have normal subgroups? So H and K, normal subgroups of G, and the intersection to be the identity. All right. And then here's what we get. Here's what that earns us. A couple of really nice calculational things. If A, B is equal to A prime, B prime, where A and A prime are in H, and B and B prime are in K, then A is equal to A prime, and B is equal to B prime. In other words, if we have these conditions, we get some kind of unique representation of each element in G as products of specific things from H and, and K. And then two, if um, A is in H and B is in K, then AB is equal to BA. It's not yet clear why we need this, but it's true and, and you'll It'll become very obvious why you want to prove this lemma when I get to the next theorem, all right? My, my next theorem is going to be, in fact, that this is the case. That's like our next theorem. This lemma is going to prove this is a theorem, okay? So let's do it, proof. Um, <clears throat> so suppose AB is equal to A prime B prime for A and B uh, and A prime and A and A prime and H and B and B prime and K. That implies what? That implies that A inverse B, B prime inverse, excuse me, let me get this right here. A inverse times AB, I'm gonna multiply on the left by A inverse and on the right by B prime inverse and see what happens. So over here, I get B, B prime, right, inverse. And over here, I get A inverse A prime. Right? And then what? Well, those are equal. This, of course, is what? This is in, that's the product of elements in a subgroup right? The subgroup is H. 
excuse me, k. So this is again in where? This is in k, right? This is where? It's a product of things in, in h, right? The inverse of an element of h is in h. Again, h is a subgroup. So this is also in, in h. So these are what? Right, these are in, in, both, in both h and k. These are in h intersect k, which by the way we've assumed is equal to e. So thus, a inverse a prime equals to e and b, b prime inverse is equal to e. Thus, a prime equals to a and b is equal to b prime, which is what we set out to prove for part one. Seems to me we haven't used norm normality there. Have we used normality? I don't think so. I don't think we use normality here. Curious. All right, so that's two. I mean, that's one. Now let's do two. All right, so <clears throat> again, assuming the conditions of the lemma, um, we wish to what? We wish to show a, b is equal to b, a. Let me replace that with an equivalent thing. This is true if and only if what? a, b, a inverse, b inverse is equal to e, right? Right? I can trade the problem of showing a, b is equal to b, a for arbitrary a and b for showing that the product of a, b, a inverse b inverse is equal to the identity for arbitrary a and b. You're like, well, why do you want to do that? Because doing this puts me in direct contact with normality. You see, notice that, so note that b a inverse, right, b inverse is what? This is an element of what? b h b inverse, which is by assumption, a subset of H, right? So, therefore, B A inverse B inverse is an element of H. Which says what? <laughs> that says that A times B A inverse B inverse is a product of two things in H, right, is again an element of H. So this is we wish to show. You should always write something like that so that the evil professor grading your paper doesn't take away points, all your points because he, he, he dreads you of the, he, he suspects you of the dreaded circular logic, right, assuming what you're supposed to prove at the outset. Always bad form, right? I'm not doing that. I'm not setting that equal to E. I'm trying to show it has to be E, all right? So I've got one thing already. I've, I've shown that A, B, A inverse, B inverse for arbitrary A and B has to be an H by the normality of H, right? But what else can you do? Yeah, you guys see where I'm going with this, right? A, B, A inverse is an element of A, K, a inverse, which is, by the way, a subset of k by the normality of k. Therefore, what? A, B, A inverse is an element of k, which implies that A, B, A inverse times B inverse is an element of k. Consequently, A, B, A inverse, B inverse is an element of H intersect k which is by assumption the identity here, right? Therefore, A, B, A inverse, B inverse is equal to E, or A, B is equal to B, A for all A and B. Well, that's not for arbitrary A and B, that's for A, for all A and what? For all A and H, B and K, right? All right. So that's the lemma.
What's that? Oh, we did. The way we use normality to be clear is right here. This is only true because H is a normal subgroup of G. This is only true because K is a normal subgroup. I'm using theorem 9.1 if you wish me to refer to Galen. I happen to remember the number. So, theorem. Um, if G is equal to H direct product with K, then um, G is isomorphic to H cross K. In other words, just to be more brief, I don't know why I've done this. Let's just say, here, let me get to the point here. H cross K is isomorphic to H direct product K, right? And if I write this, I'm assuming, what am I assuming? I'm assuming that H and K are normal subgroups of a given group G with trivial intersection. That's all packed into that symbol, all right? So here's the proof. Let phi of uh, x comma y equal to x y. And we can prove that this is an isomorphism. Let's do it. So um, note psi uh, phi is into as x an element of h, y an <laughs> element of k implies that x, y is an element of h, k, which we're assuming is equal to, of course, h direct product k, right, by the definition of direct product. So it's definitely into. More than that, it's onto, right? Because we know that if x and y, if x, y is an element of the direct sum, right? Direct product, I keep saying sum, I'm sorry. Then phi of x comma y is equal to x, y, right? So that shows it's a surjection. There's no loss of generality in assuming that um, you know, I guess you might worry that it's not um, well defined there, but if we have, I mean, it's, if I have x, y is equal to x prime, y prime, then x prime is equal to x and y prime is equal to y. So the, you know, part one of the lemma takes care of the, whether or not this is well defined as I've, I've just written it. Okay, so um, homomorphism. So check this out. So here if we have phi, of say x y times a b, right? What's that equal to? So here, of course, I'm assuming, um, you know, x and a and h, right? Y and b and k, right? So this is equal to what? This is phi of what? The def definition of direct product is that that's x times a, and that's y times b, right? That's how we defined the external direct product: just multiply component-wise. And then the definition of this is xA times yB, right? Then what? Well, now I can commute them, right? Because A is in H, but Y is in K, so I can commute these, and I get xYAB, voila. So that's phi of xY, phi of AB, So it's a homomorphism. We needed the commuting to get the homomorphism property. And then finally to show that it's an injection, the kernel of phi would be what? It'd be x comma y such that what? Such that x y is equal to, to e, right? But that's equal to e e. Am I right? You know I'm right. Okay, so <laughs> what does this say then? <coughs> by by uh, by one over there, right? We have x equals to e and y equals to e. So this is just equal to e. In other words, the kernel is trivial, so it's an injection, so it's a bijection, so it's an isomorphism. And there you have it. 
Yeah. Can you go over again real quick how you're allowed to compute those? Part two of the lemma. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the one is from H and the other is from K. But yeah. Where did I put my, oh, here they are. All righty. Um, <clears throat> our next result is a calculational masterpiece. I mean, this thing is just amazing. Here it is. Theorem, stupidly useful. Uh, if we have the order of x and the order of y um, <laughs> less than infinity, if you have two elements of finite order, then, um, and I mean in context, right, and, and x, y are elements of, say, you know, uh, the Cartesian external, uh, external direct product of g and h, then the order of the tuple x and y is equal to the least common multiple of the order of x and the order of y. Let's see here. So suppose the order of x is equal to m, and suppose the order of y is equal to n, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Let the, um, the least common multiple of m and m equal to s, right? So what's that mean? s is equal to like m times k, and s is also equal to like n times l for some things. It's a, it's a common multiple, right? And um, if we calculate x, y to the s, well, that's equal to x to the s, y to the s. You could prove that. And so that's equal to x to the mk, y to the nl, which of course is just x to the m to the k power, and, and y to the, to the n to the, to the l power, which of course is just what? E, right? So therefore, the order of x, y is less than or equal to the least common multiple of the order of x and the order of y, which I called s, right? And what else? If you had the um, order of x, y to the j power was equal to e for some j less than s, what would that mean? That would mean that x to the j was equal to e and y to the j was equal to e, right? But if, if some power of a group element gives you the identity, how is that related to the order of the element? So we said that the order of x is m. If x to the j is e, what does that mean j has to, what's the relation of j and m? Could we say m divides j? Or do we say j divides m? j has to be a multiple of m, right? So, and n divides, divides j, right? In other words, J is what? J is common multiple of M and N, right? But J is less than S, and if S is the least common multiple, uh, we're in trouble, <laughs> right? So no such J can exist, and we can trade this inequality for inequality, right? By the way, in retrospect, in retrospect, 
earlier this lecture, we proved that the by explicit and you know inelegant computation that the order of x and y was what? What's the order of x? Three. What was the order of y? Two. What's the least common multiple of two and three? Six. Yes. And if you think about it, this proof is exactly the same reason that we saw that element had order six, right? Um, this this is surprisingly useful, though. Like for example. Um, you know, you could ask a question like, number of elements of order, I don't know, <sighs> marker not very good. Let's see here, I'll do seven in, let's see here, Z49. Uh, direct product with Z7. So in other words, we're saying that you have an element AB, right? And the order of A and B is equal to 7. How can that happen? Either you've got the order of A, I mean you need the least common multiple, right? Of A and B, of the order of A and the order of B to be equal to 7. So if, if A is that's in Z49, right? And if this is in Z7, how's that work? <clears throat> See, in the notes, I break it into three cases. I suppose you could break it into two. Um, I'll, I'll break it into two here. The order of A could be seven, right? And you have two choices for B then. Either B, the order of what? The order of B is equal to what? It's either equal to one, or the order of B could be seven, right? Those are your those are your choices. If if the order of A is seven, right? If on the other hand, if the order of A is one, then you've got to have order of B be seven, right? Um, Okay, so how many, or, how many, there's just, so let's just do some enumerating here. Now we're going back and borrowing heavily from our work in enumeration of things in cyclic groups, right? Um, this, well, this is just group theory, day one in here, right? One of these. There's one element, one identity, right? How many elements of order seven <coughs> in Z7? No. What are the generators of Z7? Anything in, in U7? There's six of them, right? Yeah, six. Six elements of order seven. Um, let's see here, what else? So how many, how many, uh, how many elements of order seven in um, Z49? Also six, right? <laughs> in the context doesn't matter. We had, we had this talk before, right? So that gives us six times seven, a total of 42 choices here. Down here we get one of these, we get six of those. So we get six total choices. So in total, you got 48 elements of order. Oh, I, I neglected to say what we were counting. <laughs> seven, sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know, but, oh, I see, I'm an idiot. You knew that already, though. Let's see here. Um, so there are 48 elements of order 7. <coughs> so how many uh, distinct subgroups of order 7 are there in Z49 cross Z7? Think about this. Every subgroup of order 7, right, comes with how many generators? How many elements of order seven? It comes with, <coughs> comes with six, right? So I'd have to divide this by six. In other words, there are, if I can't do math here, eight, eight subgroups of order seven in Z49, direct product with Z7.
my energy is waning. I'm going to project. Yes? <laughs> um, is this theorem also why we oh, no. use the LCM to find orders of permutations? Is this also why we use the LCM to find orders of permutations? Ooh. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I hadn't thought of it that way. Why do we use the least common multiple to find the order? Just multiplication of yeah, for me, for me, it's just a calculational principle. Um, there's probably a perspective you could come at where that would be a legitimate, like, statement. I mean, I don't know right off to think about. That's an interesting question. So. <clears throat> Where I'm going here, you guys, is I've told you a little bit about how it works for two things. So you might wonder, how does it work for three things, or four things, or five things, or six things, or k things? And the answer is pretty much the same. Um, before I get to that, though, there's one more result, which in a perfect world I'd spend 10 minutes to work out in front of you. But the world is not perfect. If you'd like to see the proof, <laughs> I am happy to do it in the help session for you tomorrow. Um, the world's not perfect. Well, I don't know. He did call her the devil yesterday. That was pretty awesome. But other than that, you know. We actually had, in a, in a presidential debate, one candidate called the other the devil. <laughs> implicitly, implicitly. I mean, he said that Bernie Sanders was now supporting the devil. Maybe her campaign manager is the devil. I don't know. But it seems to me the likely candidate for that is Her Highness herself. Let's see here. That, that debate was fun. That one was, that one was more fun. So my next result, oh, by the way, um, I, f I should work in my zoology comment. It's important. So the way to think of this, right, is like elements of order seven um, are like legs to a spider. No, wait a minute. Ant. They're like legs to an ant, right? You got six, right? So if you want to count the number of ants, you got you to divide by, divide by six, right? So like, it would be like counting ants by counting their legs. Now, uh, Agalian says, has another example where he counts sheep by counting their legs. You divide by four, right? So I've, I've got, you know, I got spiders for eight things. But that's kind of like the limit of my, you know, group counting. I don't have enough animals to go around with. I mean, I've seen some seven-legged <laughs> spiders, but, you know. <laughs> I suppose if we're willing to... Uh, I've seen some I guess if we're, uh, you know, if we're willing to bend our ethics a little bit, we can create animals of any number of legs that we wish. <laughs> but oh yes, so here's the theorem: if G, if G and H are finite cyclic groups, then the direct product of G and H is cyclic if and only if the orders are relatively prime. This is so simple. This result is amazing, and the proof is actually not that hard. Basically, the proof says this. If you assume that they have relatively prime orders, you can then prove that the, um, the, the, cart the, the pair, the tuple of their generators, has, um, has order mn. And consequently, the order of the group is mn, which shows that g cross h is cyclic. That's pretty much it. The converse direction, if you have cyclic, um, if you have the g cross h is cyclic, then you have an element of order mn. See, the thing is, I know that g cross h has mn things, just by set theory. If I look at the Cartesian product of two finite sets, the number of elements in the Cartesian product of two finite sets is the product of the orders of the, of the sets. That's just set theory. I'm using, that's a basic thing we know already from like 200. We might know from 200. Um, anyway, it is true. 
there really isn't much more here. I mean, if you want to, we could spend a day constructing the bijection between um, G cross H and ZMN, but I don't think it would be terribly instructive. Just, you should know this. If you have a Cartesian product of two sets, the size of it is the product of the sizes of the sets, provided they're finite. If they're infinite, well, that's a longer story. Anyway, so if you look at x, y to the mn over d, and d is the common divisor of m and n, so this is an integer, it makes sense to raise to this power, then by a product of fine external uh, products, you have this, but then that's, you know, y to the n and x to the m are both e, because we're assuming that the order of g and the order of h is n, and remember any element in a group raised to the power of the group was the identity. We proved that with Lagrange's theorem, it was a corollary, remember that? So that's how I know that. And, um, but then that's E, which says that the order of X, Y is less than or equal to M, N over D, but the order of, I mean, I know that X, Y generates the group G cross H, so if this is equal to M, N, and if you have that, well, that makes D has to be one. So there you have it. Proof is actually, like, this is a fair test question, this proof, I mean, it's not that bad. Um, anyway. Once you have that, then you have stuff like Z6 is isomorphic to Z3 cross Z2. Like I said at the beginning of class, right? This, I knew this because of this theorem and this corollary. All right? It's so simple. For three things, um, the definition is a little bit more cumbersome, but basically you have to assume that you always have the intersection of the first i of them with the i plus the one, one is the identity, and they all have to be normal. You can prove, in fact, that's your homework problem, um, to prove that the product of normal subgroups is normal. I don't think that's a hard homework problem. Don't be scared by that. You don't need induction. You can just, you, you can state it. I don't think you need induction. You can just write it down for k and explain the error. I mean, I'm not looking for a formal induction proof on that. If you want to, if it makes you feel like a better mathematician to do it that way. I'm not going to stop you. I'm just saying I don't care if you do or not. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, anytime we're doing something with, with an n floating around, we're trying to prove it for arbitrary n, you could do an induction that's kind of silly. Um, okay. Um, see, all, all the inductions that I didn't do and you took points off are silly. Mm, it's fine. Um, okay, so there, there's the definition of internal direct product of, of n things. And guess what? The reason we make that definition is because there's also a lemma, same kind of lemma for n things. If you have the product of n fold, pro, you know, n fold things and they're in their respective slots, then you get equality of each component, so to speak. It's, it's like, it's almost like there, it's, you can see it's almost just a different notation for the n tuples, right? They're not n tuples, they're products, right? But that's how they're behaving is like n tuples. And that's why there's an isomorphism with the direct product of the n things. Um, and, and also we, we get, the, this is a kind of fancier way of saying that if you have um, n elements from the different uh, normal subgroups, these are independent normal subgroups, you could say, then you can, you can permute them any different which way you want and you still have equality which is just a fancy way of saying they all commute with each other every different which way. Now, I give a partial proof here. I got tired of it. All right, I get pretty far into it and then I kind of punted. I'll let you read that. The isomorphism is very simple. It's just like the proof I did carefully for two. You just take the n tuple and you convert it into an n product and you can argue that it's a homomorphism because once you write it out, you can commute the elements and put all the a's together and all the x's together, and that gives you the homomorphism property. Surjectivity is almost for free, and injectivity comes from a, basically the same reason we had in the last time. There's also this theorem. The least common multiple of an n-tuple is the order of the, uh, the tuple. So like, for example, if I have z6 cross z3 cross z4, I want to find elements of order 6. All right, um, so how can I get six from a product of three numbers? If you find an error in this, don't tell me, because I just wrote this and I haven't checked it. Um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure the order, you could have A equals six, and the order of B could be one or three, right? The order of C could be one or two, 
Um, and it doesn't matter. I have a, the six wins, right? I get at least common multiple six. And um, so the way I do this, I, I just invented a notation to organize my counting. So like the number of A's here are two. There's two elements of order six, right? Numbers relatively prime to six, one, five. There's two of them. So that's why I got this two here. Um, then one or three, there's one element of order three, one, two elements of order three, right? So I get one plus two is three. How many elements of order one or order two? There's just one element of order two. There's just one element of order one. Um, so that gives me two. So I get 12 in this case. Similarly, I get two in the, it's got two from here, one from here, one from here. So that's two. And then one element of order one, two elements of order three. The number of elements of a given order is always the same. I hope you guys have noticed that. It's not group specific, right? It's just about the Euler phi function, right? The number of elements of order D is phi of D. Right? So anyway, so there you go. 16 elements of order 6. And I said it follows that there are eight cyclic subgroups of order 6. And each, each cyclic subgroup of order 6 has two generators. So this would be like uh, counting people by counting legs. Do you know some other interesting two-legged animal I could, some by, what's that, ostrich? Oh, ostrich, oh, I like that. I say, Come on, Lorenzo. I'm going to start calling you Lauren. Emu. Emu, okay, all right. You got to put the Z in zoology, right? Let's see here. Um, so if we have cyclic groups of finite order, there's also a n-fold copy of the relatively prime thing. If I have n cyclic groups of finite order, then the, um, the direct product is cyclic if and only if they're pairwise relatively prime. Isn't that fantastic? And the corollary, of course, is you can do the same for um, you know, z, z mod n. For example, since 105 is 3 times 5 times 7, z105 is isomorphic to z3 cross z5 cross z7. That's an if and only if, right? So it is not the case, in fact, that Z8, right, is not isomorphic to Z3, Z2 cross Z2 cross uh, Z2, right? Because these are not relatively prime. That's an if and only if theorem. It's not if they're relatively prime, then that. It's if and only if. It's fantastic, this result. You should really meditate on this and internalize this result. It's very, very important for doing calculations. So like here's Z20. Um, since 2 and 10 are not relatively prime, it's the case that Z220 um, is Z2 cross Z10, right? Now, you could break the Z10 into what? It's Z2 times Z5, right? Because 2 and 5 are relatively prime. So I can break the Z10 up into Z2 cross Z2 cross um, Let's see, the other way I go, I could, you could also do Z20 is Z4 cross Z5, right? Like that. Since 4 and 5 are relatively prime. Oh, excuse me. Not, I'm missing this very important word, not. There's supposed to be a not here. Typo. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I got the not over here. <laughs> yeah, but see, this is an anathema. I, I, I need to rewrite this sentence so that this can't confuse idiots like me. Um, okay, anyway. And then finally, chapter 11. We got a minute. <laughs> so, theorem. I'm not going to prove it. I'm just going to tell you. The result of chapter 11 <laughs> is easy to understand, but it's hard to prove. Every finite abelian group is the direct product of cyclic groups of prime power order. Moreover, the number of terms in the product and the orders of cyclic groups are uniquely determined by the group. This is easier to see than to read. Let's see it. So like if we look at P, you got ZP. If you look at P squared, your choices are ZP squared or ZP cross ZP. If you got P cubed, your choices are ZP cubed, ZP squared cross ZP, ZP cross ZP cross ZP. These are the distinct isomorphism classes of abelian groups of order P, P squared, and P cubed, respectively. That's all you got. Now, it's possible that you can write them in various different fashions, right? But um, like, well, here. 
for example, um, if you look at the abelian groups of, of order 100 up to isomorphism, you've got Z4 times Z25. This is like 2 squared, 5 squared. You've got um, Z2 cross Z2 cross Z25. You got yourself a Z4 cross Z5 cross Z5. You got yourself a Z2 cross Z2 cross Z5 cross Z5. These are distinct choices. These are the, the four distinct isomorph uh, d distinct abelian groups of 100 up to isomorphism. Now, so what I'm saying is between, you, you, together with the least common multiple thing, the relatively prime result, and this, this, this claim, you can pretty much break down what do abelian groups of a particular order look like, just what are the possibilities anyway. And so if somebody tells you, I've got an abelian group of order such and such with this property, you can check it and see if it's reasonable or not by just going through the different possible cases. It may or may not be true. I mean, there's all kinds of cute problems. Chapter 11, you know, all the problems there. There's like tons and tons of problems here to look at. Anyway, I shut up. Thanks, guys. None of this is nearly as hard as the problem I gave Nathan in the take-home quiz. <laughs> <laughs>